the work that I'm going to be talking about is on learning latent variable models, and in particular, I'm going to focus on two tasks. One is a structure prediction, uh, and the other one is content-based uh, image retrieval. And uh, what I discuss is joint work with some people uh, at the UPC and Antonio Torralba at, at MIT. Okay. So these are two of the typical examples that vision researchers would like to solve. So uh, one example uh, is the problem of scene classification, where we have scenes and you want to be able to say what kind of a scene uh, the image contains. Uh, another example, which in this case would be example uh, of structure prediction, is that you have some video sequence and you want to be able to predict at each point in time what gestures are being performed. Um, so uh, we all know that image spaces are very complex and uh, high dimensional. Uh, and uh, in order to be able to learn mappings from these complex spaces to semantic categories, one of the approaches uh, that we can take is using uh, latent variables. Um, so why uh, to use hidden variables? Well, uh, you are probably familiar with the classic mixture model. So there the idea is that you have some complex distribution and you want to uh, model it as a mixture of simpler uh, distributions. Uh, so uh, today I will talk about a little bit more general view of this mixture model where in fact what you want to learn is some function uh, of some input and perhaps a label uh, and what you are going to uh, assume is that this function is also a mixture of simpler functions. Uh, and then the uh, latent variables also play an important role in a structure prediction problems. So for example, if you have a gesture uh, recognition problem, you can imagine that there is a latent space of pose uh, that is actually explaining uh, your labels. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, um, you, when you use latent variables in the context of structure prediction, it's not that different from the classic uh, mixture model way in which we use latent variables. Because what we are doing is that when you want to predict some label at some point in your sequence, then what you're actually doing is predicting that label as a mixture of uh, simpler distributions. Uh, okay, so here is uh, the roadmap for what I'm going to discuss. So first, there, there's two big sections on the talk. So the first one is on a structure prediction. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to focus on a sort of new or at least rediscovered approach uh, to learn uh, latent variable models in, in the context of this problem. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a different problem, but also show how we can uh, use uh, latent variables. And, and this problem is, is content-based uh, image retrieval. So, okay. So what do I actually mean by structure prediction so that we're all in the same page? So you are probably all familiar with the classic binary or multi-class prediction. Uh, so there, there is a single input and, this, and a single label. So in the case of structure prediction, the input itself is somehow complex or structured. So for example, your input might be a sequence and your output will also be a sequence of labels. Um, so in fact, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focused uh, in particularly on sequence prediction. Um, so you can think, well, why not to model a sequence prediction problem as just multiple isolated uh, binary or multi-class classification problems? And the idea in modeling as a structure prediction problem is that there might be important interactions between the labels that you might want to capture uh, in your model. So typical examples. Uh, of structure prediction problems. So in uh, natural language processing, we have part of speech tagging, where here what you have is a sequence of words, and what you want to predict 
is a sequence of semantic tags for, for these words. So here you could imagine, uh, sorry, a, a sequence of, you want to predict for each word what is the role that it plays in the sentence. So here you can imagine that there's multiple interactions between the, the actual labels because if you know what was the role of the previous word in the sentence, maybe that will help you figure out what is the role of the current word in the sentence. And you can think that in gesture recognition, it's also, we are also having uh, similar relations between the labels that we want to predict. Because if I know the, the label of the gesture that was performed just before, uh, or just after, that might help me in deciding what's the label of the current frame. Uh, so those were examples of sequence prediction problems, uh, but in vision we have also seen examples of, uh, of more general structure prediction problems where the underlying graph is not necessarily a sequence. So for example, in image annotation, you might want to uh, tag re regions in an image with some semantic labels, and there actually it seems quite critical that you need to take into account the labels of, uh, of surrounding areas. Uh, and we have seen multiple applications of this in, in the vision community. Uh, okay, but I'm going to focus on sequence prediction models. Uh, so what is the role of latent variables here? Well, uh, I like to think about latent variables as summarizing everything that I should remember about what I have already seen in order to predict uh, the future. <coughs> so uh, they really allow me um, to, to have a way of compactly modeling uh, a lot of dependencies in, in, in the data. Um, okay, so um, when I describe the structure prediction problem, it's really about modeling pair sequences of inputs and outputs. Uh, but in order to introduce the, the learning algorithm that I'm going to present, uh, I will actually start by focusing on a much simpler problem, which is just learning uh, distributions over, uh, single, uh, over single strings, over, sorry, over single sequences. Uh, furthermore, I'm also, just for the beginning, going to assume that my space of observations is, is discrete. So uh, instead of actually having some continuous observation, I have uh, a, every observation is a member in some, in some alphabet. Uh, okay, this might seem unrealistic, but actually, there are cases where you could even apply this kind of model to vision problems. So if you are doing gesture recognition, uh, then <clears throat> what you could do is train from segmented sequences, and you could train one uh, sequence model for, different, for each of the different gestures. And then if you want to predict the label of a, of a sequence, you'll just pick the model that gives the highest probability. Uh, with respect to working with discrete observations, uh, I think we are all very familiar with the process of taking a continuous distribution and doing some vector quantization uh, so that we actually map that continuous vector to some uh, discrete label. Uh, okay. So in order to explain the algorithm, what I'm going to do um, is uh, first introduce um, a, a way of representing distributions over sequences that is going to be useful in understanding and deriving how the learning algorithm works. Um, OK. so. For those, some of you might have uh, seen in the literature uh, what are called operator models representations. So they are more or less well known in the signal processing community. I call them weighted automata representations, but they are more or less the same. So, okay, I have some distribution over uh, sequences. Uh, remember that each of my observations belongs to some uh, discrete alphabet, so I have here are some uh, K symbols. Uh, and the way I'm going to parameterize this distribution is by having some initial state vector 
uh, which is going to be n-dimensional, where n is the number of states that I'm going to use to model this distribution. And then for each symbol in my alphabet, I'm going to have an operator. Uh, the operator is a matrix, uh, which is uh, of size uh, the number of, of states by the number of states. And you can think about the operator uh, as a, a function that when I apply to a state, uh, so if I observe something, I, if I get an observation, I apply the corresponding transformation to the current state vector and I get a new, and I get a new state vector. Um, so the way that the, the distribution uh, is uh, represented or is computed <coughs> is by uh, using these operators essentially as a linear dynamic process. Um, so how would we map from example from the standard HMM representation to the weighted automata representation? Well, in this case, uh, you can think that the operators uh, essentially are combining uh, transition and emission probabilities. So you will have an operator for each symbol where the entry uh, corresponding to the eth row and the jth column is the probability of transitioning from state i to state j and emitting some symbol uh, sigma. Uh, and once you look at it in this way, you realize that the equation that defines the weighted automata representation is essentially a way of writing the forward-backward equation in, in matrix form. Uh, OK, so what is this spectral learning about? Uh, well, so essentially spectral learning algorithms, what they try to do is exploit the Markovianity of the process so that you can compute all the model parameters from uh, only observed statistics of your distribution. Uh, they, they have recently uh, become quite popular uh, in the machine learning community. And you might ask, well, why? Uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, well, one reason that for me is quite appealing is that they are uh, very fast and they can scale very easily to large data sets. But then there's also another justification, which is that these methods are easier to analyze in a theoretical sense and, that, and you can give guarantees about them. Um, so I would like to add something, sort of a disclaimer. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with subspace learning methods for linear, linear dynamic systems, uh, you will see that a lot of the ideas uh, of the spectral learning methods to learn distributions over uh, sequences are essentially very similar. So the ideas themselves are not new, but it's their application uh, to learn uh, distributions over, over sequences or over structured objects in, in general. Uh, OK, so in order to describe the, the main concepts of the algorithm, uh, it's going to be useful to define uh, some uh, matrix that is going to represent our distribution. Um, and this is the Hankel matrix. So how we define a Hankel matrix is that uh, for every possible uh, prefix a string, we will have a corresponding row. And uh, for every possible um, uh, suffix string, we will have a corresponding column. Um, so as, uh, since we are modeling um, distributions, uh, sorry, and the entry that corresponds to a prefix and a suffix is simply the probability that the distribution gives to the concatenation of those two strings. Um, so as you, as, as you could see, this is in fact an infinite matrix because we are modeling uh, distributions over infinite sequences. But uh, the reason why it's uh, important to, to think about this matrix is because we know that if the probability distribution uh, that was used to compute this Hankel matrix is generated by a weighted automata with 
and states, then it must be the case that the rank of this matrix is, is n. Uh, and okay, this might seem not very useful because anyways we cannot uh, estimate this infinite matrix, but as it turns out, uh, by, uh, you can show that if you just have some sub-block of this matrix, where a sub-block it will be defined by a subset of, of prefixes and suffixes, then you can also guarantee that the sub-block sub -block will also have rank n. Uh, okay, so now we will always be working with some sub-block H of our Hankel matrix. Um, so one, uh, the one nice property of, of, the, of this sub-block, which we are going to exploit, is that uh, it can be factorized in terms of uh, two matrices. Um, so here, if you take the, the row corresponding, uh, sorry, the entry in H corresponding to the P uh, prefix and the S suffix, and you actually write down uh, the equation for that probability, what uh, you will see is that you can write that probability as the product of two vectors. So one vector, which I call the forward vector, which essentially corresponds to running the process until you finish, uh, until you see the last element of the prefix, and then you will have some state back. Uh, similarly, we can run the process from the end of the sequence to the beginning, sorry, from the end of the sequence to the beginning of the suffix, and you will also get a state vector. So the, the final probability that we get for the concatenation of these two strings is the product of two vectors of dimensionality n. Uh, and if you do this for all uh, your prefixes and suffixes in the subblock, you see that you can arrange them uh, as the product of two matrices, a forward matrix where the rows correspond uh, to forward vectors for each prefix, and a backward matrix where the columns correspond uh, to, to the, backward, uh, the backward vector for each suffix. Uh, so we can see that this is, in fact, a, a rank um, n um, factorization of this, this Hankel subblock. Uh, OK, so why do I care about this? Well, now imagine that I define another uh, Hankel matrix, which I call Hankel sigma, uh, where the rows, uh, the, the entry corresponding to the, P, the row P and suffix S, uh, I'm sorry, and column S, is now going to be the probability of the prefix of some symbol sigma in the middle and the suffix. So it's going to be the probability of these strings that puts the prefix and suffix together and uh, some uh, uh, symbol of sigma in the middle. So if, again, if you just write down the expression for that probability, uh, you will see that you can write it as the product of one vector times a matrix, uh, which in this case, this matrix is the operator matrix that we want to recover, and some, and some other vector. So the main trick of how to recover the operators of the distribution uh, from observable quantities uh, is exploiting uh, this factorization and uh, the relation between uh, H uh, sigma and uh, the operator. So uh, here we see that if someone will tell me what uh, the backward and the forward matrices are, I could uh, I could recover the, the operators of the model. Uh, but okay, this might not be very useful because I don't really know what B and F are, uh, but the, the, key, um, the, the key idea uh, behind the spectral method is that we don't need uh, that particular B and F, but actually any or almost any uh, rank n factorization of H will also allow us uh, to recover the parameters of the model. 
So here is um, an sketch, well, and in particular, the spectral method is called a spectral because it, it uses the, the thin SVD decomposition of H as, as this factorization that we exploit to recover the, the operators. So here is a sketch of the general algorithm. Uh, so we will assume that we uh, have a way of choosing prefixes and suffixes. Uh, I'm not going to give details on that, but uh, once we chose that, then we can compute, estimate the values of this Hankel matrix by just sampling sequences from the distribution. Then we can also estimate H sigma for every symbol. And then all that we do uh, is compute the, the SVD of H and uh, we can uh, recover the, the operators of the model. So uh, in the case, uh, there is one sort of well-known uh, algorithm for discrete HMMs. Uh, and in this case, the actual stati observable statistics that you compute are statistics about uh, bigrams. So here, H at IJ is the probability of observing some particular pair of symbols and statistics about trigrams. And from that, you can uh, recover your model parameters. Uh, OK, but uh, here I started motivating uh, this discussion by introducing uh, the problem of uh, structure prediction. So in a structure prediction, what we want to do, we know is model pair, uh, pair uh, input-output sequences. So uh, in that case, we can also derive uh, spectral algorithms that will retrieve the parameters of the model. Uh, but notice that in this case, um, the, the actual operators will now be indexed by two symbols, because we have two sequences. Uh, but in essence, the, the way in which the spectral method works is, is the same as for the previous case. It's just that the observable statistics that we compute will now uh, look both at the input and output uh, distribution. Uh, OK, here are some experiments just to illustrate uh, how you could uh, apply the spectral method to some, to some vision problem. So here the task is that you have a video sequence uh, of some tennis game, and you want to predict the um, you want to predict the action that is being performed. Uh, the actual experimental setting is that we have sequences from different games. We cut them into subsequences, uh, and then uh, we uh, partition uh, this data into some training sequences and test sequences. Uh, and uh, the evaluation metric that we are going to use uh, is the F1 measure, which uh, gives us a notion of the precision and recall for uh, recovering uh, each uh, of these action labels. Uh, OK, in terms of features, uh, what we use is for every, <coughs> so for every frame, we can compute uh, Hox 3D uh, descriptors, which are computed uh, around uh, player bounded boxes. Uh, and then we'll have two representations, one in which uh, we map this descriptor to some discrete set, where essentially what we do is take the descriptor and take the, the code book, book entry that is more similar to it. But we will also consider a representation where when we take a descriptor, in the, instead of just mapping it to one, um, to its closest uh, code, uh, code book entry, we'll actually get a distribution of our code book entries, uh, which is proportional to how similar that, that descriptor is to each of the code books. And obviously, I, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, you can uh, derive a spectral method for both uh, that can exploit either uh, representation. Um, OK, so what are the goals of the experiment? Well, it's, it's just simply to show that 
by adding uh, latent variables and uh, using the spectral method to, to recover the parameters, you could actually uh, perform better than if you would have a vanilla model that uh, models the pair sequences but has not uh, latent variables. Um, so here we compare uh, against a, a, con a standard conditional random field and what we see is that uh, for both representations, so here the, what I have is, <coughs> is the performance of the different models uh, as a function of the number of, of hidden states. Uh, and we see that uh, for both uh, representations, adding latent variables always improves over the model that doesn't have latent variables. So here the model without latent variables is, is these straight lines um, because, well, they don't have state, uh, so it's always the same. Uh, okay. Uh, well, now we are going to switch to the second part, so we are going to stop talking about structure prediction and move uh, to a different problem where we uh, are also going to be exploiting latent variables. Uh, and in this case, the problem is uh, content-based image retrieval. Um, so the, for those who are not familiar with the problem, uh, so here what you have is that you, are give, you have some database of images and uh, you are given a query image and what you want to do uh, is find images in your database that are most relevant to that uh, query. Uh, okay, so again the same story, images are complex and uh, in, you might have a database that is very diverse. So for example, if you have, if your database consists of images of scenes, well, it might be that uh, there are, we know that there are many different types of a scenes. There are indoor scenes, outdoor scenes, and you need somehow to uh, be able to capture uh, all this variability in, in your model. Um, so for example, it might be the case that if you have a query, uh, and imagine that this query is of an outdoor image, and I want to find uh, relevant images in my database, well, maybe for that type of query, uh, <coughs> we really want the, the database image to have a similar color distribution, uh, because we know that that is what is relevant for this type of query. Uh, but perhaps if you have, sorry, uh, if you have an indoor image, uh, which is the query, then maybe color is not that important and there should be other features that I should be focusing on when I'm computing the, the relevance function between a query and a database image. Uh, so, okay, what are we going to do? We are going to use latent uh, classes to model all this variability in the, in the query space. Uh, okay, so first I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what I think is one of the standard ways of learning uh, ranking functions from, from some form of, of supervision. Uh, okay, so uh, the setting uh, is uh, that again, we have database and uh, what we want, we have database and uh, training queries. So what we want to do is learn a relevance function that given a query and an image from the database, it tells me how relevant is that image to this query. Uh, and one common setting uh, is to assume that uh, for every, uh, for every pair of images, I have some way of computing uh, elementary relevance functions. So what could be an elementary relevance function? Um, so for example, I can take two images uh, and say, uh, well, if both images have the same uh, color distribution, uh, then uh, 
I will, under this, under this particular relevance function, I will give a high score. So you can imagine that you have automatic ways of computing these, these elementary functions. Uh, and then what you want to do uh, when uh, you are learning a ranking function uh, is to be able to weight these different elementary, uh, elementary relevant functions. So that means that uh, you want your final uh, relevance function to be some combination of the elementary ones and the way that you want to decide the importance of each of these elementary functions is by exploiting some particular form of supervision that I'm going to describe. So the, the most general way in which uh, we can think of uh, providing supervision to learn this ranking uh, model is uh, to assume that we have some set of triplet constraints. Um, so what is a triplet constraint? Well, essentially, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be a set of three Im of, well, so what the triplet constraint says, so here if I had a triplet constraint QAB, it means that uh, I want my relevance function, the one that I will try to learn, to rank the image A as more relevant to the query Q than another image B. So essentially the triple constraints that I'm going to give to my training algorithm are partial orderings that I want my final uh, relevance function to, to satisfy. So once uh, you have uh, these uh, constraints, the standard thing to do uh, is uh, to set up some optimization uh, so that you can find a relevance function that agrees with those constraints. So here, for example, a, a common uh, loss to use in this optimization uh, is analogous to the hinge loss for classification. And all that you are doing is that you are saying if uh, my relevance function order the points, order the, the points in the triplet correctly, then I will pay no penalty. Otherwise, uh, I will pay a penalty which is proportional to how wrong I got it. Uh, and, uh, well, once we have a loss function, we can set up the problem in the standard framework of a structural risk minimization where we will have some regularization and we are going to try uh, to minimize this loss. Okay, so this is the standard thing. Um, this, if you choose this particular loss function, then what you will get is, is a ranking SVM. So this uh, is something that people have been doing uh, for a while uh, to, to learn uh, relevance functions. Uh, so what we are going to do is uh, instead of having, okay, so here we are having one uh, global relevance function that independent, that regardless of the type of query is always going to evaluate uh, in the same way. There's just one function. So uh, what people uh, have proposed is models, for example, where uh, instead of having one uh, relevance function, you will have one relevance, sorry, one relevance function for all the queries. Uh, what you will do is have one relevance function for each test point, for example, so that you get a query and you'll train a model uh, just uh, for that query. But we are going to do something different which is uh, to introduce a relevance function that is going to be a mixture of uh, specialized, if you want, relevance functions. So we, we will have, uh, we assume we will have some uh, uh, set of uh, classes. These classes uh, G will be latent. I won't actually see them at training. Uh, but then for each of these classes, uh, I'm going to train a different uh, relevance function. 
And then my final relevance function is going to be a, a combination uh, of, of, um, of these different functions where uh, once I get a query, I can compute the probability that that query belongs to the different classes. Uh, and that is going to be the weight that I'm going to use to decide how, um, how important uh, a particular relevance function should be for that query. Um, so the way to think about this model is that what we're doing in some sense is a coerce to find ranking model, where you first get a query and you make some coerce decision of, okay, this type of query is probably an image of an outdoor scene. So once you know that, you'll actually use a ranking function that is specialized for uh, images of, of that class. Um, so <clears throat> the way that we optimize this model, well, first, now we'll see that in the, in the model, we have two set of parameters. So we have uh, the parameter z, that before this was just a vector that parameterized a single ranking function, but now it's going to be a matrix because we will have a ranking function for every possible class. Uh, but then we also have the parameters of the, of the distribution that will assign um, that will assign queries to uh, latent classes. Uh, so before we had a nice convex problem, now this is no longer a convex optimization problem. So what we're going to do is uh, do some simple alternating optimization strategy where you'll fix one set of parameters and optimize for the other ones and you will alternate this process. Um, So I'll just say very little about the actual parameter estimation. Uh, but when, so we use a subgradient method and when we look at, when you look at the updates, how is the function changing, uh, you'll see that what will happen uh, is uh, that how the, the influence of a particular uh, query in uh, the update of a ranking function will depend on how probable is that that query belongs to, to that class uh, given the, the current uh, parameters of, of the model. Uh, and similarly, uh, the, what the updates will do is that if uh, you have a ranking function that predicts very well a particular image, then you will increase the probability that that image corresponds to, to, to that class. Uh, okay. oh, so now I will describe some experiments. So uh, what we did is that we work with the SAN data set which is a big data sets of uh, scenes. Um, and when we did this, and I think there were 12,000 uh, 12, images. I think today there's many more because uh, Antonio has been adding more and more. Um, so the images in the SAN data set are annotated uh, both with um, scene labels, but also they are annotated, many of them are annotated with object labels. So there, there are actually tags that tell you what objects are in, in the image. And why is this relevant for us? Uh, is because I told you that what you need to learn a ranking function is uh, this set of triple constraints. So, um, an obvious way of defining triplet constraints, it would be to have a real user interacting with the retrieval system, and you can imagine that uh, from some user feedback, then you can derive constraints uh, that tell you that, okay, this, the, this image is more relevant to this query than some other image. Uh, but we didn't actually want to have to build a retrieval system so what we did is to derive ground truth uh, constraints 
from uh, utilizing the object annotations. Uh, and so essentially what we do is uh, we have some <clears throat> some way of taking two images that are annotated and looking at the similarity between their tags and in that way we can uh, generate uh, constraints that we know our ranking function must, must satisfy. Uh, so, <clears throat> so in particular what we do to generate the constraints is that uh, we take uh, so we have this way of computing distances based on tags. So we take an image and we get its nearest neighbors according to, to this uh, distance based on tag similarity. Uh, and then uh, we, we sample other images which are not neighbors. And in this way, we get, we get the triple constraints. Uh, and in this process, we, when we do this for many images, we end up with a total of more than 300,000 uh, ranking triplets. So one thing uh, that one thing that I haven't uh, maybe mentioned about the learning algorithm uh, is that uh, because it's essentially just a gradient descent algorithm is uh, very very scalable. Uh, and in fact, you can also run it in an online manner. So then it's, it's very easy to have lots uh, of constraints. So in order uh, to compare, so what are the models we're going to compare against? So the first thing we compare with is, is a global SVM, which is what I defined at the beginning. It's a model that learns this uh, global uh, relevance function. Uh, and we're also going to compare it with a transactive SVM. So uh, in this case, what happens is that uh, once I get a test query, what I do is look at the constraints, uh, at the triple constraints that uh, involved images uh, that are similar to that query, uh, and then I train a model only using those constraints. So this means that so each time I get some test example, I sort of train a model only using uh, the training data from the local neighborhood. Uh, so this has been tried for different problems. I think there's also work on, on object recognition using this transactive framework. So one of the problems with this is that each time you see a test sample, you actually have to retrain your model. Uh, OK, and then we have our model. And what we report is uh, the precision and recall. We'll sh I'll show you the precision and recall curves uh, for the task of uh, retrieving the 100 most relevant images for each test query. So uh, here we have some results. Uh, and uh, well, there's two settings. Uh, I, I think you, you can uh, ignore the distinction between the two settings. We can focus on the first one. Uh, and well, the first thing is that it's, it's a very hard problem. Uh, so here we see that the, the mixture model always outperforms the, the, the other two baselines. Um, you might wonder, OK, but how relevant is that little difference? Well, it might be. Well, it is statistically significant. But uh, the, to give a concrete example, if uh, you want to get the 20 most relevant images for one query, so so I, I give you the query and I say, I really, I know there are 100 images there that are relevant. And I tell you, at least I want to get 20 of those. Uh, then uh, what, the, what this curve shows is that uh, in the, if you use the mixture model, you only need to look around 220 images before you find those uh, 40, uh, sorry, those 20 relevant images. While if you use the other models, you'll need uh, to look uh, 
at like 280 images. So there is a significant error reduction in, in that sense. Uh, so here are some examples of, of the actual output of the system. So what I have in the center are the, the queries and on top I have the true ground truth neighbors and on the bottom I have the predicted ground truth neighbors. So what we saw is, well, something that, that we know about this database, uh, which is that outdoor scenes are always much uh, more easy to, to model than indoor scenes. So the, the results that you get for getting neighbors for uh, outdoor scenes, they all seem pretty good. Uh, but when you get to indoor scenes, uh, I mean, we can still retrieve similar images, but it seems to be much more tricky. Uh, so you might be wondering, okay, so I started uh, the motivation of why to use latent variables by saying that we want uh, to learn uh, some, we want to be able to, to learn that in this space of images, there are actually some classes, uh, subclasses of images. And in fact, when we look at the, at the distribution of the hidden variables, that is, if, if I look all the images that were assigned uh, to a particular class, then we see that it actually kind of makes sense because uh, it's really modeling the variability that, that we would like to model in this data set. So for example, we have some, some class that what it's doing is clustering together all images of outdoor uh, scenes, which are like uh, beach images, and then we have some other class that is clustering uh, buildings. So it's, it's learning something uh, sensible. Uh, okay, so to summarize, I've, I've talked about two quite different applications. Uh, but the idea was to show that uh, this approach of using latent variables uh, in fact can be useful for a variety of, uh, of problems. Uh, and the other message that I want you to live with uh, is uh, that a spectral, so you are all probably familiar with expectation maximization algorithms for training latent variable models and uh, well, I've, I think you should also consider in uh, spectral learning methods uh, because they, they are also a good alternative uh, and well, they have this, this property that is very easy to implement. There's, it's probably a few lines of code and that you can run it in a very large uh, data set with no, with no problem. Uh, and in terms of future directions, uh, well, one of the things that I would like to do is, is to, to actually test uh, these spectral methods uh, on real vision problems. I mean, what I show you was kind of like an illustrative example, uh, but I think it would be very interesting to see what are the potentials of these techniques in, in real large scale uh, uh, problems involving in particular sequence prediction. Uh, and uh, in terms more of the machine learning future directions, um, what would be very nice is if we could exploit these spectral methods, but not so much in the context of a structure prediction and, and, and supervised learning, but more on the, uh, but use them to, in the context of unsupervised learning, uh, where what we actually want to do is to model a distribution over complex uh, structure objects. And thanks. <laughs>